So the title is Circulation and Value Judgment, Rethinking World Literature. This is the title I have um, sort of for today's lecture. Uh, the first, uh, I think, when we talk about world literature, sooner or later, we always go back to the beginning of 19th century, uh, uh, 1820 uh, some, uh, when uh, the German poet um, Goethe, uh, of course, he was the one uh, who made world literature an important concept. Of course, uh, contrary to many people's belief that he didn't coin the word uh, uh, Welt Literatur. Before him, already some authors already used that term. But because um, in the early 19th century, Goethe was already uh, in his old age and he was a very respected figure in, in Europe. So when he talked about world literature, uh, people uh, listened uh, and uh, started to discuss it. And uh, he was, of course, um, he uh, talked about world literature uh, in several places, in his letters, in his uh, lectures, and so on. But the most important and perhaps most famous uh, was his conversation with uh, his young secretary, uh, uh, Johann Peter Eckermann, um, and precisely uh, on January 31st, 1827, because we know the date. And he said, I'm more and more convinced that poetry is a universal possession of mankind, revealing itself everywhere and at all times in hundreds and hundreds of men. National literature is now rather an unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand and everyone must strive to hasten its approach. This is very famous. But again, this term, world literature, uh, was quite vague. He didn't really... Uh, uh, went further to define the term, and therefore, uh, for a very long time, world literature was not really the target of study uh, because it's not uh, it's not clear what what exactly is world literature. For example, uh, Claude Guillen, a, a very uh, 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 you know um, famous comparatist uh, in the in the twentieth century, he was actually uh, one of my teachers at Harvard. Uh, he had some criticism of uh, Goethe's idea of that uh, literature. He said, what can we make of such an idea? The sum total of all national literatures, a wild idea, he said, unattainable in practice, worthy not of an actual reader, but of a, a deluded keeper of archives who is also a multimillionaire, <laughs> somebody who has to pay for a lot of rare books. Um, but he went on to uh, discuss two possible meanings uh, to make sense of what word literature might mean. One is those works that have been read and appreciated beyond the frontiers of their countries of origin. This actually was very close to what David Damrosch uh, later, uh, when he was uh, redefining uh, word literature. Another um, meaning, he said, is works of writers of the first or very high rank. Now, uh, these two are actually important for, for redefining world literature, but for uh, Claudio Guillen or for Goethe himself at that time in 19th century, um, the, the second one, for example, those works that have been read and appreciated beyond the frontiers of the countries of origin. Uh, Goethe himself was very happy when his own work was translated into French and other languages. For example, uh, his, his famous uh, um, a play Toccato uh, Tasso was translated into French. And he talked about how the time of world literature already arrived. And he used that literature. But when the French journal Le Globe uh, reported uh, Goethe's words, translated into French, uh, literature européenne. So world literature becomes European literature. And for 19th century, particularly for French scholars, um, they would think that literature worth studying is only European. Uh, there's no other literature beyond Europe. Uh, we know that uh, Hugo Merzo, for example, um, defined uh, comparatist or comparative literature should have 10 languages, uh, what he called a decaclitismus. But the 10 languages is all European languages. So there was no um, um, further uh, wider scope of literary studies. And this is different from from Goethe's uh, vision. So uh, Claude Guillen, even though he talked about this, but he dismissed this concept because this 
appropriate by 19th century European scholars as referring only to European literature, not really world literature. So the problem with Welt Literatur is too vague, and therefore it needs to be redefined in order to really make it uh, workable as a concept. And I think this is the contribution of David Damrush. Uh, in his book, What is World Literature? Uh, he redefined this. He says, world literature encompasses all literary works that circulate beyond the culture of origin, either in translation or in the original language. And his example is Virgil was long read in Latin in Europe. Okay, so this is uh, David's redefinition. And th this redefinition becomes widely accepted and very popular and very important. So I think uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of the 21st century, world literature becomes one of the most important and vibrating uh, new wave of literary studies everywhere, uh, in not only in the West, but also in China, in Japan, in other parts of the world. And I think the importance of re redefinition is to make world literature from a very vague and impossible uh, huge number of works to a manageable, relatively speaking, manageable uh, number of concept or category. Because uh, Franco Moretti also says, reading more is not the answer. Uh, the categories have to be different uh, when he talks about word literature, redefining word literature. So the category, uh, David Damarash's category is circulation. That is a work has to be circulating beyond its culture of origin. In other words, uh, beyond its na uh, native readers, because all the works of literature are written in a particular language, either English or French or, um, you know, whatever language. Uh, so the natural kind of home is a national tradition of literary uh, tradition, uh, English literature, French literature, Chinese literature, or whatever. Uh, but then uh, many of the works, of course, can be very famous within their own natural condition. For example, China is, 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 a, is a good example. We have a very long history and many, many important works, very great works, but they are all well known in China for centuries. But none of these works are circulating beyond the culture of origin beyond China. That's one of the reasons why my re most recent publication is a history of Chinese literature. <laughs> I usually do comparative study, but recently I just published uh, a book on, uh, on history of Chinese literature because um, it, it, it's, it's great work, uh, great literature, but it's unknown in the world, basically. Um, and therefore in this definition, the redefinition of uh, Damrush, you can see two things are very important. Well, the first is of course circulation, because a work has to circulate beyond its culture of origin to enter the sphere of world literature. Otherwise it can be very famous as an, uh, within its own cultural uh, tradition, but it's not known beyond that. And that, uh, however great it is, it's just a, a work of a national literature, not world literature. So circulation is the important criterion. The second, of course, is language, uh, either in translation or in the original. The original, his example is Virgil, because Virgil, uh, he was read in Latin. And Latin, of course, is so-called lingua franca in Europe, at least for a very long time from the late uh, antiquity to medieval time to early modern time until late 19th century. I think all uh, students in Oxford, Cambridge, for example, are required to study Latin. Um, but in 20th century is no longer true now. Uh, so Latin is no longer the lingua franca used to be. In East Asia, for example, in China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, uh, pre-modern time, the written the Chinese literal Chinese language was the lingua franca because all the books are published or written in not just in China, but in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam uh, were all written in Chinese. Okay, but this again in 20th century is no, no longer the case. So in a sense, English becomes the de facto lingua franca. That's why <laughs> we're holding a conference and speaking in English. Um, <clears throat> but circulation, uh, has its problem. 
I think I, I, David and I were, were friends and uh, we agree with uh, a lot of things, but uh, I, I think his redefinition also has some limitation. Um, here you can see that uh, in Damarash's book, he says, well, literature is not an infinite, ungraspable canon of works, but rather a mode of circulation and of reading, a mode that is as applicable to individual works as to bodies of materials available for reading established classics and new discoveries alike. Now, this is a very general definition. Uh, anything that is read uh, beyond its culture of origin would be um, word literature. And I have a problem with that because circulation is uh, more or less uh, a, a marketing, you know, um, uh, sociological concept. A book, a book can be bestsellers, and we we know that uh, there are so many bestsellers in New York Times and other countries all have their own uh, list of uh, bestsellers. But bestsellers are not necessarily the best works of literature, and most of the bestsellers can be read and then thrown away and forgotten very soon, just like fashion. Uh, in, in clothing and, and, and other things. So um, circulation is a descriptive word, you know, whatever is circulating in the world, uh, saying nothing about the nature or the quality of the work circulating. I think circulation is important. Indeed, without global circulation or what cannot be uh, world literature. So, uh, so in that sense, circulation is a very important concept, but it's not the essential definition that makes a work of literature, word literature. Now, I understand why there is such a problem. And in, in fact, I believe word literature becomes very popular in 21st century is in some sense, in, at least in my view, in some sense is returning to, read, to, to the reading of literature. Because we know that in the 20th century from the 1970s to 1990s and, uh, and, and beyond, uh, a very exciting thing for literary studies, literary theories, all kinds of literary theory from new criticism to Russian formalism and to um, structuralism, post-structuralism, uh, hermeneutics and so on. So all different kinds of literary theories uh, discussing literature and uh, uh, you know, really provide some depth and, and, and profundity and analytic uh, critical insights uh, into the reading of literature. But we all know that, uh, and, and very quickly also, I think in 1980s, 1990s, uh, gradually um, literary theory were replaced by the so-called critical theory, cultural studies, uh, become more and more politicized, actually um, uh, became a, a very ideological, uh, as the so-called ideocritique, ideology uh, critique, uh, and also, um, Many of the uh, theories, critical theories, uh, moving away from literature, discussing anything but literature. Film become very popular. Uh, study of anything for cultural studies, uh, you know, literature is not that important. Anything that provides uh, a kind of ideology uh, it, it can be a, a carrier of ideology, either for or against us, and that is the purpose for cultural criticism. And that becomes uh, a problem. And uh, people do not read literature anymore. And uh, also uh, classics and canon and aesthetic pleasure, all this became uh, problematic. For example, Frank Kermot, uh, when he gave the lecture in 20, uh, 2000, I think, uh, in uh, his panel lectures uh, in Berkeley, he deliberately chose the canon um, and aesthetic pleasure for the topic of his discussion. You can see his discussion uh, as customary for, for Tanner lectures. He has a group of people as discussant. And one of the discussants was John Guillory, uh, a cultural critic from New York um, University. And he was very strong uh, against, basically against uh, Frank Kermode's lectures and uh, put down the talk about canon, talk about uh, aesthetic pleasure. But Frank Kermode also didn't mean his words either. When his response and is very, very strong to insist the importance of aesthetic pleasure. Uh, and, but all this becomes problematic. And that's why I think uh, Davis Damer's redefinition really didn't touch on the idea of um, canon, classic, or aesthetic pleasure or aesthetic value at all. But I, I believe this is a, a limitation. Without this, um, you know, anything that circulates becomes 
the only criteria. And then I, I would think uh, that that's not a good uh, good good criteria uh, for world literature. Of course, circulation, popularity, and best selling is not necessarily uh, contradictory to aesthetic values. Some works that uh, became very popular uh, when it's produced and became uh, finally became a classic. That's possible. You know, Dickens, for example, some of his uh, novels in nineteenth century uh, was published in an uh, installment. Uh, in magazines were very popular and later became uh, important uh, works in English literature. So uh, best-selling and uh, uh, canonicity or aesthetic uh, values are not contradictory, not exclusive, mutually exclusive. But that is to be decided by literary criticism, not by uh, circulation itself. You know, circulation doesn't tell us the, 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 the work circulating is good or not. I mean, by good and not, I, I mean, uh, is having aesthetic values or not. You know, we can, of course, have a whole debate of what exactly is aesthetic value, why it is important. But for me, this is a very important concept. And that is why uh, circulation is not good enough. And of course, circulation as a sociological concept here, uh, I'm quoting uh, my friend <laughs> Kenan Tihanov. I, I understand you're also here. Um, recently he has published an essay and in which he um, have some criticism, and I agree with him. He says, circulation does not seem to be to me to be uh, furnishing the right optic here, because the idea of ready artifacts freely moving through the supply chain uh, of the book market imagines the spaces traversed uh, uh, by literature as flat, leveled, and somewhat monotonous terrains, whereas in reality, the relief is rather varied. Uh, to be fair to uh, Damrush, he does not want to uh, just emphasize the sociological uh, side of things because he also argues uh, the, um, the circulation when a work circulates or travels, the receiving culture would play a very important role. So how the work would be received and how it would change is very much depending on the receiving side of, uh, of this uh, process of circulation. So in that sense, he can say that uh, circulation can also be a dy dynamic process. It's not a uh, kind of a, a, a static uh, um, a process. But other than this idea of uh, critique of sociological concept, uh, there is also a, a critique of circulation as a value neutral concept. Now, I think this is, um, uh, a more important uh, uh, criticism. Work literature, uh, I'm quoting Dehanov again, uh, work literature which, uh, as a discourse is generally far removed from uh, classical uh, literary theory uh, based as a letter often was up to and even including deconstruction and close reading of texts. This plays here an important, um, um, I, I'm sorry because, my, I cannot read my own PPT because it's covered by by, by people's uh, faces. But anyway, um, anyway, I, I don't want to read this. I mean, the whole idea is that uh, um, Tihanov also argues it's important to pay attention to aesthetic values of works of literature, and uh, and circulation does not cover that. Uh, this is completely uh, I agree with uh, this uh, understanding of this because. Um, indeed, um, uh, circulation, as I said, is a descriptive, a soci sociological concept. It's really, uh, you know, uh, how many books are sell, how many, you know, a marketing strategy, sales numbers, and so on. Uh, really, doesn't really talk about the aesthetic side of literature. And literature, as art of language, uh, is something that was supposed to give us pleasure. I mean, uh, I, I would agree with Frank Kermod. It's very important to have a sense of the aesthetic value of literary works. Otherwise, why you want to study literature? Why do you want to become a student or, or professor or scholar of literature if you don't really like it? And, and Frank Kermode's uh, an analogy is, uh, is uh, it's wine testing. He says, if you, if you don't have a nose for the wine, uh, and then you'd better not do uh, literature <laughs> because you should, uh, you know, a good wine drinker, when you, smell the, the wine, you know the wine is good or not. Uh, if you don't have the nose, you shouldn't do, um, do this, or otherwise you're in, in the wrong business. And <laughs> this is Frank Kermode's uh, response to John Guinnery. Uh, 
Well, John Gillery's analogy is also interesting. He says uh, he compares the study of literature to a biologist or 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 medical uh, study. Uh, you know, an, uh, a medical study uh, study germs. He says uh, germs does not provide pleasure, and uh, uh, some cases will get you get uh, infected. So that's a quite different analogy. <laughs> I think that analogy of uh, uh, virus and the infection. Now we are living in the COVID period. We know exactly what it means. And I think it's a very sad analogy for literary studies. Uh, I, for one, I love literature. <laughs> I would never think of literature will give you a, a, a virus with something like that. You know, I, I lived through the Cultural Revolution in China. At that time, all the literary study, all literatures were, were called poisonous weeds. You know, Shakespeare, were, great Chinese poetry, will give you poison. You'd better clear out of this wrong ideas. And I hate that idea and I live through it. So I'm, um, you know, sort of, sort of cured forever for that kind of uh, talk about, you know, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I think the, the, um, the love of literature is the basic, the very fundamental requirement for anybody who studies literature. Well, otherwise, why study literature? Literature doesn't provide you with anything that is useful, actually, I don't. Uh, I often tell my student in my in my class. I said I don't teach you anything useful at all, uh, uh, useful in a practical sense, because I don't teach you how to make medicine to kill people, or teach you how to make weapon to kill people. <laughs> but uh, you know, enjoyment of literature is what I teach, and uh, critical mind is what I teach. So I think all this is very very important. So in a way, circulation I think has its limitations. Very interestingly, uh, David Damrush also, uh, in his very last chapter uh, in, in his book, What is World Literature? He actually, the last chapter the title is World Enough and Time. And of course, that is a quotation from a very famous poem by uh, Andrew Marvel uh, to his coy mistress. Uh, have, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. But then, of course, it goes on. He said, uh, but at my back, I always hear time's wind chariot hurrying here. We don't have time. So that is why we, you cannot study all the works. You have to study the best of all the works. That's why I argue uh, canon or classic should be the work that become part of world literature. Uh, if the problem with world literature, that little tour, as uh, Claudio Guillen, uh, called a wild idea is because the number is too many. You cannot study all the works of literature. It's not a sum total of all the national literatures. It's impossible. Why? Because we don't have enough time. You know, our lifespan is limited. Uh, unfortunately, that, that's the human situation. Uh, if we can fo uh, live forever, that's not a problem, but we don't have all the time. So we need to read the best of books. Therefore, we need critics of different traditions to tell us what are the best works in their own traditions, to introduce those works into, you know, beyond the culture of origin and become a circulation in the world. And that is a condition to have the expansion of world literature into more uh, uh, inclusive concept. Because in practice, what we call world literature today is still mainly, uh, by and large, works of European or Western literatures. Uh, uh, not the non-Western literatures or even the minor uh, European literatures. You know, who is the greatest Dutch poet? Nobody knows. Who is the greatest uh, Rom Romanian or, or Serbian poet? You know, very few people will know that. But of course there are in, e in every uh, literary tradition worth the name of a literary tradition would have great works. And those works should be and, uh, in, in introduced to the uh, world readership um, through translation, through discussion, through scholarship. Translation is just first step. But then through translation, through uh, scholarship and uh, uh, discussion, uh, then people would realize why these works are important, why we should read them, even though this is not our own literature, so to speak. So uh, I think in 21st century, um, you know, we, we are living in a in more and more globalized world, and uh, we're also conscious of different cultures and traditions. And hopefully we can all become more open-minded to, to accept literature, culture, not of our own. I think that would be the definition of a 21st person. 
you know, uh, otherwise you become so narrow minded, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, provincial. Um, so, so that, that, that's the, uh, the hope I, I think uh, I have for world literature. It's not just the, um, the English poet, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> not just the English poet, Andrew Marvel, but I'm also quoting, for example, a Chinese philosopher, a Taoist philosopher, Zhuangzi. Um, of course, the Latin is, is Western, as longa vita brevis, but Zhuangzi, the Chinese philosopher, also says, my life has its boundaries, but knowledge is boundless. To pursue the boundless with the bounded, that is perilous. Okay, so that is also the same idea that our life is limited. So we should use our time wisely uh, and uh, with the best. So finally, I think the uh, um, idea of world literature uh, or world literatures is a multiple concept because in different places, different cultures, uh, when people teach world literature in different universities courses, uh, they're going to be different because they will have different emphasis with different uh, reference frameworks and refer to different works and so on. So world literature should be uh, a multiple concept and uh, active and in different situations. Um, it is the differently, I, I would argue, uh, localized world literature that makes the notion surprising, unpredictable, and stimulating, and thus contributes to the richness of world literature as such. So. Um, on the one hand, I'm arguing that uh, um, um, world literature now is only uh, major European and Western traditions uh, works from Homer to Dante to Shakespeare to Dickens to even contemporary uh, writers. Uh, but I'm not against the so-called canon. I'm, <laughs> I'm the last to argue um, <laughs> for decanonization. I think decanonized decanonization is a stupid idea and it has a misunderstanding of the nature of what canon is. But I am arguing that world literature should be more than just Western literature, should expand. And how to expand that is by introducing different works, the canonical works of different literatures, which are yet unknown and not well translated, well studied, uh, and should introduce those uh, to the world and then become part of world literature. So I think this is what I basically, what, what I have to say, and I hope uh, we have uh, more time for discussion. Thank you very much.